Hello, and welcome back to the MBLEX review course. Today, we're talking about standards of practice, ethics, guidelines for a professional practice, and according to the Federation of Massage Therapy State Boards, 28% of the questions you will answer on your exam will have to do with ethics, massage laws, business regulations, and operating a professional practice. That's about three out of 10 questions or about 28 out of the 100 questions on the exam. And you know what? Some of this stuff we didn't learn in massage school. So let's roll up your sleeves, put on your thinking cap, and get ready to absorb and learn in out of these three categories. Standards of practice in massage therapy, how those standards of practice relate to guidelines for a professional practice, and ethics and the ethical practice of massage therapy. Sounds like fun, right? Yeah, not really. Well, anyhow, it's necessary. <laughs> Our class today is divided into sections, and here is an outline of what we'll be covering. Definitions of principles, integrity, morals, values, in the second section, we'll look at the NCBTMB's official standards of practice, the NCBTMB's code of ethics, some guidelines for professional practice. We're going to talk about dual relationships, boundary crossing or boundary violations, and then wrap up with the AMTA code of ethics. We would think in looking at this list, at looking at this outline, that this stuff would be common sense, right? Well. Common sense isn't so common, so let's define some terms and that'll get us all on the same page. Let's start with principles. Principles are rules or laws of behavior that enable a person to behave with integrity. Also defined as a fundamental truth that serves as a foundation for a system of beliefs. It's like fundamental norms, rules, values that really represent what is desirable and positive. And used in a sentence, I believe that respect and kindness are two of the most important principles that my parents taught me growing up in regard to how to treat people. A use of principles in a sentence. Moving along, integrity. We talked about principles being something that allowed someone to act with integrity. But integrity is the quality of being honest and having strong moral principles moral uprightness, and there are three levels of integrity. Keeping one's agreements, being true to one's principles, and the highest level of integrity, being true to oneself. We look at morals, which is a person's standards of behavior or beliefs concerning what is and what is not acceptable to them. Rules of ha or habits of conduct. Morals especially have to do with sexual conduct, with in reference to the standards of right or wrong. It's our thoughts on right or wrong. But again, using uh, morals in a sentence, moral excellence comes about as a result of habit. We become just by doing just acts, temperate by doing temperate acts, brave by doing brave acts. That's Aristotle. Kind of an old reference there. Looking ahead, we're looking at values. And these are the principles and beliefs that influence the behavior and way of life for a particular group or community. Important and lasting beliefs or ideals shared by the members of a culture about, again, what is good or bad, desirable, undesirable. Values have a major influence on a person's behavior and attitude and serve as a broad guideline in a lot of situations. Used in the sentence, uh, here by Ellen DeGeneres talking about values. Quote, I stand for honesty, equality, kindness, compassion, treating people the way they want to be treated, and helping those in need. To me, those are traditional values. So now that we've defined a few common terms that we're going to be using throughout this course, I wanted to look at the standards of practice. That's a funny term, standards of practice. So let's take a look at the definition. They're guidelines used to determine what a competent massage therapist should or should not do in practice. So standards of practice. Standard may be defined as a benchmark, an expected level of care 
based on a defined degree of excellent. Some are going to be very excellent, some are not so much, but it's a standard based on that degree of excellence. So all standards of practice provide a guide to the knowledge, skills, judgments, attitudes that are needed to practice safely and the standards are based on the premise that the massage therapist is responsible for and accountable to the individual client for the quality of care that they receive. So who decides on our standards of practice? Did a group of massage therapists just together and randomly come up with how to practice? Well, sort of. <laughs> we launched the first national exam. Successfully passing this test would show a higher understanding of the massage therapy as well as how to work the body. It was going to achieve reciprocity in a number of states, but now the NCBTMB focuses on recognizing massage therapists with even more training and experience, and they do that through something called a board certification. So the NCBTMB is a national association for massage therapists. Board certification is a voluntary process and one that's very different from state licensure or state certification. Obtaining a license sets the minimum competency requirements to treat clients. But board certification demonstrates that the massage therapist has had 750 hours of training and a minimum of 250 hours of professional experience. Oh, and massage therapists who want to be board certified have to pass the board certification exam. One other thing that I'd like to highlight about the NCBTMB is that they officially determine who is and who is not a provider of continuing education for massage therapists. The NCBTMB, otherwise known as the National Certification Board of Therapeutic Massage and Bodywork, has articulated the following six standards for the practice of massage therapy. So standards in practice. The first standard is professionalism. Massage therapists must provide optimal levels of professional therapeutic massage and demonstrate excellence in practice by promoting healing through responsible, compassionate, and respectful touch. Professionalism is demonstrated by adhering to and maintaining current and active licensing status, using safe and beneficial methods with, cl with clients, and adhering to the standards of practice, operating with a high quality character. Treating each client with dignity and respect, using professional communication, providing an environment that's safe, using hygienic practices. But how does this show up at work? Well, wearing a uniform, being on time, treating coworkers and managers with respect. Makes sense, doesn't it? Well, our next standard of practice is number two, legal and ethical requirements. Massage therapists must comply with all the legal requirements applicable jurisdictions regulating the profession of therapeutic massage and body work. Simply speaking, that means obey all the local, state, and federal laws that apply to massage and body work. But does your state issue a license or a certification? There are still four states in the United States without regulation. Now, to qualify to practice in your state, eventually you must pass the massage and bodywork licensing exam, which is pretty much why we're here. Otherwise, that test is known as the, the MBLEX. Let's move along. Standard number three, confidentiality. A massage therapist shall respect the confidentiality of client information and safeguard all records. Now, here's a question for you. Can a massage therapist share client information with other medical professionals? No. In order to share confidential medical information, clients are required to sign a medical release form. No signed form, no info. Healthcare providers are required by law to keep medical records and health information strictly confidential. After signing a medical release form, after a client signs a medical release form, that allows doctors and other medical professionals to exchange information with you and from you. Now this is in response to the Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act, otherwise known as HIPAA laws. All the way back in 1996, the HIPAA laws mandated these requirements. 
this release form is essentially a waiver from liability for sharing information. Next we have standard number four, business practices. The massage therapist shall practice with honesty, integrity, and lawfulness in the business of therapeutic massage. Best business practices. Well, what does that look like? Some best practices are client-centered. Some are following the rules. Well, to follow the rules, we must first know the rules. Here are a few terms you may or may not be familiar with. Copyright infringement using someone else's words or ideas as if they were your own, reproducing, displaying, or distributing another's work without permission from the copyright holder. Another term you may or may not be familiar with, intellectual property. That's a legal concept which refers to creations of the mind, literary works, images, for which exclusive rights are recognized. Common types of intellectual property include copyrighted material, trademarks, patents, and even some industrial design rights. Another best practice is to understand the differences between employees and independent contractors. Employees have taxes taken out of their checks. They are employed by an employer and at the end of the year get a form called a W-2. The W-2 is the form that an employer must send to the employee and to the IRS at the end of the year. And that form reports an employee's wages and the amount of taxes that have been withheld. In fact, employers are required to withhold Social Security and Medicare, and they're also required to match those amounts and deposit the funds each pay period. The employers pay 6.2% along with the employees who pay 6.2%. By comparison, independent contractors receive a 1099 miscellaneous form. The 1099 is a tax form that reports the year-end summary of the non-employee compensation. So no taxes have been taken out and taxes are now due both on the state and federal level. And independent contractors pay 100% of their Social Security and their Medicare. Now let's look at a, a review a few of the different forms of business entities. We've looked at employees and independent contractors, but what type of business entities do they typically work for? Well, there are a few, and I want to just familiarize you with what they're called. The first one we'll take a look at is the sole proprietorship. A sole proprietorship is usually one owner. There's no state filings to form a sole proprietorship. The owner reports the business profits or, or loss on their personal tax return. It's a very simple and straightforward business entity. And what we see a lot of small businesses operating as, and that's a sole proprietorship. If there is more than one person involved in the business entity, it could be a partnership. Partnerships are pretty easy to form. There's no state filing to file the form or to become a partnership. Partners are personally liable for any li lawsuits that are filed against the company. But regarding taxes, things look a little different. In a partnership, both partners file an individual tax return, but the partnership uses something called a Schedule K-1 to report each individual's share of the partnership income or deductions. Now a partnership is a legal relationship between two or more people in which both agrees to furnish part of the capital, the labor for the business enterprise and by doing so it fixes a proportion of their ownership to the profits and or the losses. But it's good to know and it sometimes comes up on your MLEX exam that a partnership is required to file uh, a Schedule K-1 with their tax return. The next business entity we will look at is the Limited Liability Company, otherwise known as the LLC. From a legal perspective, the LLC is independent from the owner, but it is taxed similarly to a sole proprietorship or a partnership. And LLCs are governed by an operating agreement. That can be a standard agreement or a customized operating agreement. We'll also look at the S-Corp and the C-Corp. So the C-Corp or the S-Corporation. The easiest way to remember the difference is that in S-Corp, the taxes go on the self, the personal tax return. And in a C-Corp, taxes are paid on the corporate profits. But you can see the comparison here. 
Both are independent legal and tax structures from their owners. Uh, both must hold annual meetings. One has a limit, the other does not, of shareholders. But really the big difference is how the taxes break out. The S Corp, personal tax return. C Corp, the corporation, is taxed on their corporate profits. Let's leave business entities and move along to another part of best business practices. Let's review the forms we may need to use when working with our massage clients. We're familiar with a health intake form. It's a standard form that a client completes on their first visit and normally that's updated annually. Soap notes. Soap notes are the massage therapist notes after a session. And guys, it's even when the client is in good health, it's good to keep a record of each of their visits. If there is a significant change in the client's health, those notes may be legally requested as evidence. So good to keep them updated after each session. Other considerations in best business practices, uh, a consent to treat form. The client, normally a minor, has permission from their legal guardian to receive massage and is mentally able to understand the treatment being recommended. We've talked about an informed consent form, permission to work on specific areas of the body, such as the gluteal region, the pectoralis region, and this is normally written informed consent. They've signed off on that. Now there's some, all sorts of different types of waivers, but I've mentioned here a pregnancy waiver, which is required only for high risk pregnancies. And the client needs to sign that if they're pregnant. Now in some cases, a waiver might not be enough. The client might need a doctor's note, um, especially if they've had a recent whiplash or uncontrolled high blood pressure. As we look at other best business practices, we want to just basically do an overview, provide a physical setting that's safe, maintain adequate liability insurance, and this is not just for the sole proprietor that is an individual uh, massage therapist, but this is for all massage therapists that you must maintain adequate liability insurance and that's normally through uh, the AMTA or the ABMP or you get it independently. Uh, maintain soap notes we talked about, uh, display the schedule of fees so that clients clearly understand what you charge, uh, making clear financial arrangements ahead of time of the session that again are clearly understood by the client, uh, and Say that you are a sole proprietor. In this case, you're thinking about maybe starting your own business. It is required to follow acceptable accounting principles, file all the municipal, state, and federal taxes, and maintain accurate financial records, appointment records, tax reports, and receipts for at least four years. I don't recommend going into business for oneself. There's so many more things to think about than just doing massage. But let's move along. So standards of practice we're still talking about. Standard number five, roles and boundaries. The massage therapist shall adhere to the ethical boundaries and perform the professional roles designed to both protect the client and the practitioner. And of course, safeguard the therapeutic value of the relationship. Roles and boundaries. If we're talking about two countries, a boundary would be a line that designates one territory from another. When we talk about two people, a boundary is a limit. It may be defined as the edge of what's appropriate professional behavior. Boundary crossings or boundary violations involve the therapist stepping out of the clinical role or breaching that clinical role. Boundaries define the expected and accepted roles between the massage therapist and clients. Boundaries function to protect the integrity of each person. It's kind of a protective circle around the professional relationship that separates what's appropriate from what's not appropriate. Now one way massage therapists boundaries uh, are maintained is to recognize his or her personal limitations within the practice and you know, operate within these personal limitations. That's also sometimes called scope of practice. But maintaining healthy boundaries also has to do with the massage therapist avoiding dual or multi-dimensional relationships. 
Dual relationships could impair the professional judgment or result in exploitation of the client. A definition of dual relationships is a relationship that's in addition to the client-therapist relationship. So examples of dual relationships, uh, social settings, seeing a client at a restaurant, familial settings, a client is related to the massage therapist, maybe it's a, a close family member. That would be a dual relationship, giving a brother, a sister, a cousin, mom, a massage. Those are two different types of relationships. And even in business, the massage therapist could buy goods or services from that client. Any relationship that is outside the therapeutic relationship is considered a dual or multi-dimensional relationship. Ooh, say that five times fast. Multi-dimensional relationship. To maintain healthy client relationships, we must understand the concept of transference. Transference is the displacement or the transfer of feelings based on childhood experiences onto someone else, like the massage therapist. These feelings are originally related to a significant person in the client's life, such as a parent, and those feelings are transferred from the client to the massage therapist. Clients experience a legitimate biological reaction based on these childhood emotions. Common examples of transference are clients feeling attracted to their therapists. It's not uncommon that a client will have a crush on a massage therapist because most because massage therapists touch the clients clients are sometimes confused because the touch they've experienced in the past may only have been experienced when the client is having a sexual experience and sometimes that feeling that sensation is simply misinterpreted another example of transference would be a client who doesn't want to make an appointment because they don't want to appear to be needy Maybe they were told by their parent there was no time for that extra attention, being chastised for being needy. And that can show up in the client-therapist relationship. We need to be aware of it. Now, a different phenomenon occurs when there is counter-transference. Counter-transference is a practitioner's unresolved feelings and issues when they are unconsciously transferred to the client. Maybe there is just a client that annoys you for no reason whatsoever. And maybe you feel like this guy in your PowerPoint slide when you hear that a certain client is scheduled on, on, your, on your day. That may well be an example of counter-transference going on. Through no fault of their own, this client is eliciting an emotional reaction in you that may not actually be about them. It might be about something something else. Well, finally, preserving the role of being a trusted massage therapist, we must recognize part of maintaining healthy boundaries is refraining from practicing under the influence of alcohol, drugs, or any other illegal substance, with the exception of a prescribed dosage of prescription medication, which does not impair the massage therapist. Now, roles and boundaries also include, likewise, massage therapists have the right to refuse and or terminate a session with a client who is abusive or under the influence of alcohol, drugs, or any other illegal substance. And as we wind down clarifying these roles and boundaries, it's important to remember the limitations of being a massage therapist. Some of our clients benefit from seeing additional medical professionals, such as a counselor, a psychologist, a psychiatrist, we must listen to our intuition and our gut and stay within the scope of practice. And finally, sometimes to clarify our roles and boundaries, we may need to have an uncomfortable conversation with a client or a co coworker. We may need to do some role playing. Role playing is when a client or practitioner act out a specific situation as a way of becoming more comfortable with handling the situation in real life. Now, please, be careful, stay within the scope of practice. You are not a licensed clinical social worker. However, role playing is helpful for a massage therapist if we have to have a tough conversation, such as firing a client, addressing late cancellation, reminding a client they had a no call, no show. We may want to role play with a colleague because that can be helpful to reduce our nerves and overall improve the communication. Alrighty. 
done with roles and boundaries. Our final standards of practice is prevention of sexual misconduct. Massage therapists shall refrain from any behavior that sexualizes or appears to sexualize the client-therapist relationship. Now, recognize that the massage, well, we recognize as massage therapists the intimacy of the therapeutic relationship. And that may activate the practitioner or the client's desires that could weaken objectivity and may lead to a temptation of sexualizing the therapeutic relationship. Now, intimacy is, design, is defined as a close familiarity. Massage sessions produce a feeling of closeness. Now, intimacy will be discussed further when we talk about dual relationships. However, simply put, in the event that a client initiates some type of sexual behavior, clarify that the session is therapeutic. And if the conduct of the client does not stop, terminate the session and understand that sexual activity with clients is prohibited, even if it was consensual. Now, do you get it? The rules are massage therapists refrain from participating in any sexual relationship or sexual conduct with a client, whether it's consensual or otherwise, from the very beginning of the client-therapist relationship and for a minimum of six months after termination of the client-therapist relationship. Let me repeat that. If there is an attraction and there seems to be a consensual interest, the recommended wait time is six months. Now, if a pre-existing relationship exists between the massage therapist and the client prior to meeting at the massage center, the therapist or the client may end the therapeutic relationship and pursue a personal one. However, that's only if there was a pre-existing relationship prior to meeting at the massage clinic. At this point, I'd like you to pause and go to the video. The video is of an arrest that was made of massage therapists for not heeding the warnings of no sexual contact with a client. By not heeding these warnings, it can really it can result in lo loss of license, arrest, and sometimes even jail. So pause that now and return once you've watched the video. It's only just a few minutes long. As you can see, my warning sign makes sense. Danger. This area is off limits. And adhering to the standards of practice of prevention of sexual misconduct, you can understand it takes 20 years to build a reputation and five minutes to ruin it. If you think about that, hopefully you'll act differently. That leads us nicely into discussing the ethical practice of massage therapy. Ethics is defined as the moral principle that govern a person's or a group's behavior. Now let's take a quick look at the NCBTMB's Code of Ethics. We are going to run through uh, because there's some highlights in there I want to share with you. The Code of Ethics simply says that massage therapists shall act in a manner that justifies public trust and confidence, enhances the reputation of the profession, and safeguards the interests of individual clients. These are moral principles that govern our profession. Here are some highlights. Massage therapists will provide the highest quality care, represent their qualifications honestly, accurately inform clients as to the scope and limitations of their practice. Massage therapists will acknowledge their limitations and provide treatment only when it's beneficial to the client. We also in our code of ethics will maintain and improve professional knowledge, conduct business with honesty and integrity. We will refuse to unjustly discriminate, maintain confidentiality, and obtain and record informed consent from the client. Moving along, we want to also respect the client's right to terminate the treatment. If the client says, I'm done, we're done. The Code of Ethics asks and requires that we provide draping that will ensure the safety, comfort, and privacy of our clients. We are going to justly exercise the right to refuse to treat any person or part of the body for just and reasonable cause. Our Code of Ethics says to refrain under all circumstances from initiating or engaging in any sexual conduct. 
That includes sexualizing the massage. Even if the client initiates no sexual behavior on the massage table, in the treatment room, or during any other part of the session. Clear? All right. Moving along. Avoid any activity or influence which might be in conflict to act in the best interest of the clients. And finally, respect the client's boundaries with regards to privacy. Refuse any gifts or benefits that are intended purely for personal gain and not for the good of the client. That doesn't mean you can't take any gifts, but it could be considered um, ingratiating. You just have to be careful with gifts. And then finally, follow these standards of practice, this code of ethics, and all the requirements that are publicized by our National Certification Board of Therapeutic Massage and Body Work. Woohoo! We're done with that. Now, did you notice we snuck in a bit of ethics in there? Let's move on to Section 2, which is Guidelines for Professional Practice. And before uh, I move into that topic, I would like to first acknowledge Claudia Duane, a senior lecturer at Temple University's Graduate School of Social In Administration. She is the author of an article called Respecting Boundaries, the Do's and Don'ts of Dual Relationships. And much of the subject on dual relationships that I'm going to share with you is taken from her article. So what are dual relationships? Massage is a profession that prides itself on creating safe, non-judgmental space. As positive as that is, when we do the job well, it ends up building trust and sometimes leads to wanting to develop secondary relationships with our clients. Now, dual relationships are defined as relationships outside the clinic or outside the treatment room. And these relationships can include non-sexual legitimate interactions, many of which are unplanned or even inadvertent. Yet, they still could have ethical ramifications. So maybe we see a client at the grocery store with their significant other. Perhaps we find ourselves in a yoga class with a client, maybe even bump into them at a local road race. Well, what do we do? Do we acknowledge the client? Rules are only if the client speaks first. Now why? Well, in this world, there are irrational, jealous spouses. <laughs> we also have to respect the client's right to privacy and confidentiality. They may not want their significant other or other people in the yoga class to know that they receive massage. Ethical issues related to professional boundaries are common. We should be concerned with dual relationships primarily because they can hurt clients, but also because they can hurt the profession and massage therapists. In fact, a number of lawsuits, the number of lawsuits filed against massage therapists has increased. A primary reason why clients sue is because they feel like they've been exploited. And exploitation is at the core of dual relationships. Now, how could a massage therapist be accused of exploiting their therapeutic relationship? Well, I want to go over a couple examples with you. And using a model from social work, we're going to run through the five categories of dual relationships. These are examples that also could be described as good intentions gone wrong. Just want you to be aware of those. The first category is intimacy. And as we said, intimacy, that closeness can be mistaken for affection. And massage is an intimate setting. It's private. It's close. There's trust. So we must take into consideration that intimacy is created in that treatment room and it can be mistaken. At the end of a session, have you ever had a client like swoop in for a hug? Look, it's a professional boundary question that massage therapists have asked for years. Handshake or a hug? If giving a hug at the end of the session, what message does that send? Use your best judgment, but plan for the handshake. Another category for a dual relationship occurs when there's potential for personal benefit or monetary gain. What if a client offers to lend you money? Massage therapists do not borrow money from nor lend money to clients. But what happens if you got named in their will? Can you control that? Not really. But 
what about finding out about a house going on the market because the client is a realtor and you find out before anybody else could the massage therapist be using the therapeutic relationship for his or her own her own financial gain maybe we have to use good judgment if we hear about a deal what about bartering do we barter with a client for services exchanging goods or service barter is exchanging good ex goods or services rather than money for massage you know it happens now and then but my recommendation highly recommend if you barter massage that you barter hour for hour not dollar for dollar I used to barter with my lawyer and my lawyer's rates were over two hundred dollars an hour anytime that lawyer came in for a massage I had to perform two two and a half massages two two and a half hours of my time to get one hour of his time so that didn't really work out and it started to create some resentment on both parts be very careful with bartering or trading our next category for consideration around dual relationships is emotional dependency and emotional needs many of us are in the massage therapy profession because we find it rewarding it fills an emotional need but when our needs interfere with a client's needs we have violated a boundary let's consider this case example an oncology client with a terminal diagnosis was widowed six months earlier and is unemployed and has a five-year-old daughter for whom she feels now incapable of providing good care she has no next of kin and so she has decided to relinquish her daughter for adoption the client notices that her massage therapist is very comfortable and relates to her child easily the client also overhears that the massage therapist is considering trying to adopt a child the client asks the massage therapist if she would consider being the adoptive parent for her daughter awkward does this help you understand how dual or multiple relationships show up in our practice there's no easy answer on what should happen in that scenario it might be in the best interest of the of the child however it's officially a dual or multi-dimensional relationship another category to consider is category number four unintentional or unplanned encounters these accidental crossings particularly in small communities are not inherently unethical but still require some skillful handling there's the inadvertent situations we mentioned um, meeting in the grocery store or at the gym attending a family gathering and realizing your cousin's boyfriend is your client these are relationships we try and minimize the risk to the client by allowing them to come to us or speak first if they do not come to us we do not initiate contact our role first role is as the clients massage therapists our final category for consideration category number five altruism the most common reason we enter into a dual relationship is because we want to help be altruistic say for example a client asks you to purchase wrapping paper for her daughter's school fundraiser maybe you decide to give your client an old computer because she needs it to study or do homework such good intentions can actually feel like a bribe or create dependency how can you decide how can you decide if entering into a dual relationship is going to compromise the therapeutic relationship well ask yourself these questions how will the secondary relationship change the power differential or take advantage of the client in this therapeutic relationship how long will that secondary relationship last is it a one-time occurrence or expected to last indefinitely how about how will ending one relationship affect the other how about will your objectivity be impaired I see massage therapy is a profession in which dual relationships are common because the nature of the work increases the clients vulnerability it's our responsibility to protect clients and demonstrate appropriate standards of care with good boundaries so handle each situation with the utmost of professionalism 
there's always room for interpretation, and many of the dual relationships massage therapists encounter are far more subtle and innocent than the obvious exploitation of a sexual relationship. So if you have questions, seek consultation through a professional organization, by asking a colleague, asking a manager, and if you're remote, support networks are even available electronically through an online discussion forum. But remember, maintain the confidentiality of your client. Never use a client's name. Next, we'll briefly discuss the difference between a boundary crossing and a boundary violation. And you're going to have some examples that you can tell me. Do you think it's a boundary crossing or a boundary violation? A boundary crossing occurs when the professional massage therapist is involved in a second relationship with a client that is not unfair, not coercive, not harmful. Boundary crossings have been defined as bending the rules, whereas boundary violations are breaking the rules. Boundary crossings are not inherently unethical, but they could be. Um, the crossing becomes a violation when the dual relationship has negative consequences for the client. The distinction between a boundary crossing and a boundary violation may lie in the difference between inadvertent and deliberate actions. So let's take a look at a few examples of potential sticky situations. So here you unexpectedly see a client at church and your client is with family members. Boundary crossing or boundary violation? It is inadvertent, but still must be handled gently. If the client initiates contact, then they take the lead. If the client does not initiate contact, do nothing. Simple. Now, another example. How about if a massage therapist finds themselves at the same 12-step meeting as a client? Is that inadvertent or deliberate? Well, it's inadvertent, but let's dig down a little deeper. Should the massage therapist limit their involvement with the group? Well, uh, massage therapists have an obligation to their clients, but they also have an obligation to their own well-being. So possible courses of action? Well, you could assume this absolutely no contact outside the clinic attitude. Um, the massage therapist may decide to go to a meeting where clients aren't likely to attend. Um, Another option would be that the massage therapist makes the best of an awkward situation, stays at the meeting and only shares a little bit. But you know, the massage therapist may be deprived of that full personal experience. And you know, the massage therapist may decide to just, just participate fully, which is a risk. Um, but if the massage therapist feels comfortable managing that risk, any option is acceptable provided that you give thought and give analysis around the decision and how it will impact the client and how it will impact the massage therapist. All right, final question. The massage therapist sends a text to a client inviting them to join uh, for happy hour with a group of friends boundary crossing or boundary violation? Is that action inadvertent or deliberate? It's deliberate and it's a clear boundary violation. As a massage therapist sending a text as a personal invitation is misuse of personal information. The client could feel awkward about refusing the invitation, feel obligated to go, and it's best not to consume alcohol with clients jokes, teasing, other behaviors that could be considered unprofessional that would weaken the therapeutic relationship. In fact, in our standards of practice, we say recognize the influential position that a massage therapist has with the client and do not exploit the relationship for personal gain. All right, hang in there. We're almost at the finish line. Moving along, we're going to wrap up with some ethics. Ethics is, design, is defined again as a group of moral principles that govern a person's group or a group's behavior. So a set of values that direct us to the right choice. And the AMTA, the American Massage Therapy Association, has drafted their own code of ethics, which we will review. They have two parts. First is a principle of ethics. And the principle of ethics 
are aspirational and inspirational standards of exemplary professional conduct for all massage therapists. Now, these principles should not be regarded as restrictions, but as goals for which all massage therapists should strive. So here are the principles of ethics. Demonstrate commitment to provide the highest quality massage therapy. Acknowledge the inherent worth and individuality of each person. Demonstrate professional excellence. Acknowledge the confidential nature of the professional relationship with clients. Do not discuss clients with other therapists. A massage therapist will project a professional image and a massage therapist accepts the responsibility to do no harm. Now, now we get serious. The AMTA also has rules of ethics. Now these are mandatory and direct and this is the minimally accepted professional conduct for all members of the American Massage Therapy Association and in my opinion massage therapists in general. Now these rules of ethics are enforceable and for massage therapists who don't adhere to these rules they could be subject to disciplinary, disciplinary action. So let's just take a peek. Massage therapists shall conduct all business and professional activities within their scope of practice. Massage therapists will refrain from engaging in any sexual conduct and to maintain the therapeutic client relationship not tolerate client behavior that attempts to sexualize the massage session. And finally, massage therapists will refrain from engaging in any activity that would violent, violate confidentiality of the client. These are not only code of ethics, but also best practices. So, massage therapists are expected to perform a client-centered session, meaning always act with the best interests of the client in mind. Make sense? Woohoo! We're done. <laughs> Finish line! Yeah! In closing, we have covered quite a lot of information today. Standards of practice, codes of ethic, guidelines for professional practice. I'd like to remind you that you also have a glossary of terms in this course. I have not taken the time to go through each and every definition with you. That glossary of terms will be very helpful to familiarize yourself. In part two of this class, we'll cover some more definitions, including um, topics on the ethical use of social media and fair warning. We're also going to cover some first aid. So is your CPR and first aid up to date? Consider planning to take CPR and first aid class if it's been more than two years. Uh, that'll need to be updated. So thanks for hanging in there through some tough material. It's now time to test your understanding of these concepts with the quiz. So good luck and we'll see you next time. <laughs>